Uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, I'm glad to, to be here and spend a little bit of time with you today. Uh, I'm glad that you all had an opportunity to, to hear uh, my friend and colleague, Rich Milner, uh, this morning. He's someone who I have a, a great deal uh, of admiration for. Uh, my name is Floyd Cobb. I'm an adjunct faculty member at the University of Denver. That is a part-time role uh, that I have. Um, my co-author, John Cranople, um, uh, is a facilitator. Uh, and uh, we've both written separate books and spent a, a number of time in our, our careers working uh, in K-12 systems, uh, specifically working and leading uh, efforts related to educational equity. And uh, what we wanted to do was uh, really kind of start a book where we were talking about our experiences and, and really thinking about it through lessons learned uh, about how to not continue to get into a situation where we're constantly being tripped up uh, over uh, and over and over again. So um, as we get in uh, to uh, the day, if, if you use uh, Twitter, feel free to follow us at these particular uh, addresses uh, and we have these uh, additional uh, hashtags. Uh, as we move through today, we want to um, <clears throat> really begin to think about kind of issues of problematic uh, equity implementation, uh, really kind of think about the, uh, essential concepts and skills related to making sure implementation works right. Um, consider how proven frameworks, and I, and I would say this broadly, uh, whether it be MTSS or um, uh, RTI frameworks, or even just general sort of improvement principles, uh, help us think a little bit differently about uh, these efforts uh, in terms of uh, how we go about trying to solve uh, our educational challenges. Uh, and so we'll kind of go through the dysfunctional cycle, do a quick overview of belonging and dignity, uh, and then get into uh, some action steps in terms of shaping a climate and culture. Uh, of dignity. As we go through this, please be sure to take some risks, keep an open mind, uh, use the breakout rooms for verbal discussion. Um, uh, I will have them probably be, uh, maybe two, maybe three, depending upon how much time uh, we have, uh, and then practice listening in the breakout room. Uh, please be sure to use the chat in the main room. Uh, and when we're in the main room, just to be able to help uh, so that, to ensure that everyone can hear, uh, we can work, do our best to keep our, our microphones muted. Uh, so the book started uh, with this uh, particular metaphor uh, of the streetlight effect. And you'll see uh, an image of a streetlight. You'll even see it in our book on the cover. Uh, you'll see it uh, throughout a number of these particular slides. And uh, the way that the fable goes is that uh, there's a, uh, an old fable where there was a man uh, at night who was uh, looking for his keys. Um, and uh, he was looking for him in the dark, but he was looking for him under this particular streetlight. And uh, after some time, a police officer noticed uh, that he was uh, looking uh, for something and didn't know what he was looking for and asked if he could, you know, be of assistance. And he said, so, sir, can I uh, help you? Can you let me know what you're, what you're looking for? And he says, I'm looking for my keys. And he says, well, do you mind me helping you? And he says, no. Uh, so the two of them spend some time beginning to kind of look around, uh, you know, up under the, the street light and continue to look. And after a while, the police officer uh, reaches a point where he's like, um, you know, I, I'm not finding anything. Are you sure you left your keys over here? And he's like, well, no, I lost my keys, you know, over there, uh, over by the fence. Um, and he goes, but it's dark over there and it's light over here. Um, and so that metaphor really kind of helped us kind of pull the thread through what we were hoping to, to think through related to our issues of, of, of equity and the failures that uh, too oftentimes uh, come about in terms of addressing issues of, of inequality. Uh, you know, specifically, we have this ongoing habit and pattern of, of wanting to just simply look where the light is, uh, as opposed to really doing the internal and difficult work of looking in those dark, dark spaces. And so we theorize this uh, in a way of basically saying that there's just a general sort of pattern that we've not only seen in our professional lives, but also uh, experienced in the support that we've offered, uh, which is that uh, there's a catalyst that's followed typically by a, a general commitment to equity, uh, then that leads to problems with implementation, and then that kind of gets us right back to the status quo. Um, spoken more broadly, uh, what you wind up happening is that is the catalyst uh, is typically like a big incident. There's like an uh-oh type of a thing uh, that happens. And in public schools, it can be something, uh, you know, as, as specific as, uh, you know, demographics changing and uh, performance results uh, having a negative impact, or 
uh, it can be a hater bias incident uh, that winds up uh, making it into the news. And, and what it does is inevitably will create this uh, emphasis and focus on this topic of equity. But truthfully, what it does is it doesn't necessarily put the focus of equity in the spotlight. Equity actually sits in the darkness it puts this focus on inequity. Uh, and the difference between those two really matters uh, because one focuses on the negative and one focuses on uh, a positive action. Um, and a lot of times what'll happen is just you'll begin to get these sort of statements uh, from the leadership of an organization of this is not who we are uh, and we believe in everything and you know, we're positive and you know, we get these sort of um, you know, proclamations um, that wind up distinguishing uh, the organization itself from the incident that led us uh, to create the statement. And for those who um, were impacted, they may look at, you know, what's being written or said kind of with a little bit of skepticism, um, but are willing to listen. Uh, and um, for those others, they're, they're kind of questioning kind of where this whole thing is going. You know, additionally, uh, you'll kind of see some form of a performative elements in a classroom level. You may see a teacher kind of wearing a shirt or a button uh, that creates some kind of advocacy. You might even see it on social media uh, in some form of, you know, hashtag-ish activism. But whatever it might be, the effort is to be able to distinguish oneself from the incident to say that I am not like them. And uh, where these challenges begin to come in is when it gets into the actual hard work of doing implementation, right? And uh, in doing that implementation, what we'll kind of say here is that when, while these challenges uh, are real and, and they present themselves in a number of different ways, uh, we don't want to say that any of these what things are bad by themselves, right? There may be a couple, but not collectively. What, we, what happens, however, is is that when they're not done in an approach that is really focused on uh, creating a clear and concise strategy, uh, what can happen is, is you wind up engaging in this sort of never ending cycle of failure. And, you know, typically what we see in the cycle of failure is, is you'll get, you know, kind of the creating the appearance of caring without actually doing anything at all. Um, you know, which is a, a window dressing. Uh, you, you can get a lot of performative elements uh, related to, to equity in terms of words without action. Um, you can most specifically get into this idea uh, of what's referred to as moral licensing. And that comes to us from the social psychological literature, which really focuses on the fact that, that we as human beings have this habit uh, of giving ourselves uh, permission uh, to do something bad once we've done something good. Uh, and when we do that, you know, they think that the simplest example would be that, you know, if we're someone who has been out of uh, the habit of exercising uh, for a little bit and uh, decide one day that we're going to get up and go run five miles because we've been out of the habit a little bit, but then as a reward or treat for running those five miles, we're going to order a large pizza, a half a sheet of birthday cake, and some ice cream and then think somehow that uh, that's gonna work, uh, what we begin to realize is that the, the pizza and the sheet cake and the ice cream all out, uh, all basically uh, took away any benefit that might've been derived from running the five miles. And that's sort of the internal monologue, right? That we have with ourselves was I'm not that bad because I did X. Very much of the same thing happens related to this conversation. One additional piece is sort of plausible deniability, which is uh, really saying, well, you know, I, I didn't do that, so I'm not necessarily the one that you need to be talking to. You actually need to be focusing on uh, these people over there. Uh, and then the phenomenon that I'm seeing a, a lot lately, which is this, this effort to, to try to drain the ocean. Um, not really knowing what the specific problem it is that we are trying to address when it comes to this issue of inequality. And so what happens is, is we try to solve every problem, right? People will try to solve racism writ large or sexism writ large, uh, as opposed to understanding what the specific issue is uh, within their, their current context. Those are a lot of the elements that we wind up seeing happen. Uh, and so typically what happens in this cycle is one of the, the first phases that comes after the catalyst is the desire to hire the diversity, equity, and inclusion supervisor. Uh, and there were a bunch of these positions that have been posted within the past 12 months um, because a lot of times the, the people in the committees may not realize uh, 
that they, they know what to do. And while these positions can be good, uh, they can also be uh, a very difficult position and a tokenized position for the people who assume them. And the reason for this is, is because more often than not, um, the, the way that these positions are structured are not structured in alignment with the actual authority of uh, the organization. So the person who's entrusted with this role is, is required to make changes in culture uh, and, and policies, but doesn't necessarily have uh, the positional authority to be able to do so. And that can happen as high at a district level or high at a university level, all the way down to a school uh, or a committee level. And so there's always a caution when it comes to the people uh, who are assigned these roles. And so as we get into our next step uh, in uh, the cycle, one of the next places that we oftentimes see is uh, the committee gets formed to be able to figure out what we need to do to go about uh, trying to, to create these changes. And a lot of times with committees is we have a lot of people who are very passionate, um, but may not necessarily have a deep amount of knowledge uh, to really be able to understand uh, what it is that they need to do uh, in order to move forward. And inevitably, uh, what can happen is, is one of the first recommendations that comes about is the, the mandatory unconscious bias training. And it is a very popular uh, place uh, for people to go uh, as of late uh, to be able to uh, think that, you know, as long as people become aware that they have some form of an unconscious bias, then they will wind up doing better. However, the uh, literature on this and the research on uh, unconscious bias training is, is starting to reveal to us that it doesn't always have the positive effect that we assume that it does. Um, one issue, for instance, is it, that it can create sort of a culture uh, uh, of moral licensing, but also uh, what it can do is, is create a circumstance or a situation whereby people uh, are um, uh, uh, feeling emboldened to be able to treat uh, those few, uh, either students of color or teachers of color uh, within their organization wind up treating them worse. And so um, while on its face, it seems like a, 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 a perfect solution, uh, what the evidence is starting to reveal uh, is that it's not always the case. Um, and one of the reasons why we see that this is a problem and we talk about this in our book uh, has to do with the fact that there's uh, a lot of times an absence of uh, a shared vision. And, and what I mean by that is the way that we uh, have this habit of talking about issues of equity uh, we actually are talking about inequity or inequality. Um, and what I mean by that is we tend to focus on the negative uh, at the exclusion of focusing on the positive and where we want to go. Uh, I've spent a, a great deal of my career working in government and working with legislators. And, and one of the things that I've learned over and over again is that it is substantially easier to kill a bill than it is to pass a bill. Uh, and the reason why it's easier to kill a bill than it is to pass a bill uh, is because uh, in order to pass a bill, there has to be shared agreement, right? In order to kill a bill, people can be against it for all kinds of different reasons and not like it at all. That very much is the same thing that we are starting to see when it comes to this conversation and topic about equity and uh, discrimination in general and how we address it. We spend a lot of time talking about the negative. We want to be against racism or we want to be against bullying or we want to be against homophobia, but we never really talk about the thing that we're for. And in the absence of us talking about the thing that we're for, we may have people who uh, are aligning themselves with us who don't necessarily share uh, similar outcomes. And so it's very important to make sure that that um, gets front loaded uh, as much as possible. One additional place uh, that happens in terms of this cycle uh, has to do with uh, once the committee starts to, to struggle its way out is looking for a fixer. Because after the mandatory uh, and unconscious bias training, uh, what happens is, is uh, people want to know what's next and what do we do? And a lot of times there will be a consultant or a professor or somebody probably like me who gets called in to say, okay, we need some help and what do you want to do? And inevitably the first place that a lot of times people go to is the diversity workshop. And the diversity workshop has been kind of a tool that's been used uh, a lot uh, over the past 30 or so years. And um, one of uh, the unfortunate results of that sometimes is this sort of split that can occur. Uh, you can sometimes have people feeling blamed and shamed um, uh, after uh, completing it, whereas others will think that, you know, the direct talk and the direct action uh, is exactly uh, what's needed. 
Uh, and inevitably, after that training, people will say, okay, well, we went through the training. There may be a little bit of fracture uh, within the organization. And they'll say, well, okay, well, what's next? What, we need to start to see some results from this work because things are supposed to change and things are supposed to improve. And um, this is kind of what takes us back to this sort of streetlight metaphor is we begin to start to look for easy answers and sort of technical solutions to a really complicated cultural problem. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, there will be a lot of folks who will think that the, the easy and the safe place to go is to focus on this element of cultural responsiveness. And uh, for those scholars who have written on this will tell you that it is a really critical idea that isn't disconnected and isn't easier, despite the fact that people might think that it is. And so um, because these concepts are theoretical, a lot of times what will happen is people will just say, okay, we'll just tell us what to do. Uh, and in their inability to tell us what to do, uh, the, the switch will then uh, move into kind of these sort of pedagogical myths and conceptions about what it means to be. And so we'll look for books about kids in poverty or looks about books for black boys or Latino girls or something that gets us into this sort of stereotypical look. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you a video real quick um, that was done from SNL uh, with Lynn Man Lynn Manuel. Miranda a couple of years ago that I think really kind of helps to exemplify kind of what this can look like uh, when it is not done well. So part of the reason why I like showing that is that that's kind of a comical uh, way of, of, of how it can appear when there isn't a clear strategy and there isn't a real focus on what the students need. And the, Result is that it leads to sort of a, an, a, an upholding and a rationalization of the status quo until another catalyst arises, um, which then kind of gets us right back into this cycle of focusing on uh, equity uh, versus inequity. Uh, and so we have theorized this uh, in this way to really begin to think about this pattern that we've started to see over and over again. And, and you might have seen it yourself or, or perhaps your organization or maybe somebody has told you um, that they've had a similar experience uh, to what this, to this. I mean, that's certainly been uh, our experience in, in talking with folks. And so obviously if not these ideas, uh, then what idea? Uh, and how we have helped to, to want to just try to think about this is really beginning to think about this particular problem in a way that isn't too dissimilar to the way that we think about uh, a number of the, the problems that we focus on uh, in uh, in schools, which require us to use these sort of broader principles of, of improvement science, right? Um, which is unlocking and understanding uh, the specific problem, uh, really beginning to develop a strategy, uh, using that strategy to reshape practices, policies, procedures, and culture, then measure the success, and then go through the process of repeating. Um, and really beginning to think about the fact that we've got to have a focus to begin with on inclusion, uh, as an end goal that is something that can be measured, create that commitment through belonging, of, of equity uh, through belonging, through dignity, uh, create a culture of dignity, have a climate of belonging, create engagement, uh, which will lead us to a greater academic success. And so John and I, are, in our book, wrote that we wanted to focus on kind of real, really three big keys, inclusion, belonging, and dignity. Um, and not trying to get too caught up in a lot of the things that are oftentimes under the streetlight. And, uh, you know, in speaking to this audience, you all are familiar with some of these ideas in terms of uh, the importance of improvement science um, uh, and really beginning to, to think hard uh, about making sure the work is problem specific uh, and user centered. I think that that is perhaps one of the greatest places uh, where we struggle uh, with this, as I had mentioned before, in terms of trying to drain the ocean. Uh, we look to be able to solve every problem. Uh, as opposed to trying to solve uh, a unique uh, and, a, and a specific problem. And so uh, working on uh, our first key of really trying to uh, inspire a shared vision of inclusion, um, and that is focused on inclusion itself, not necessarily uh, this idea of diversity. Uh, because a lot of times what happens is, is we can say that we believe in diversity or want to focus on diversity or want to place diversity as a goal, but really and truthfully, diversity can't necessarily be a goal because diversity is a reality. 
right? Whenever we have more than uh, two people in a room, we are gonna have some form of difference. Uh, that difference is always uh, gonna present itself. So it's not something that we necessarily need to work towards, rather it's something that we need to be able to accept uh, as an inherent reality uh, within our lives. Um, and so uh, John and I have tried to conceptualize this through um, this concept of really four diverse environments. Um, and you can see on this slide, just looking at it, uh, it's also in the handouts, how uh, each of these particular environments is a little bit different. Um, three of them are squares, uh, or two of them are squares. One is a square with a circle on the outside. Uh, another one looks like it used to be a square. Uh, and, uh, you know, in putting these together, we categorize them as segregated, excluded, integrated, uh, and included. And we went ahead and put these on a Cartesian plane uh, for uh, clarity in terms of our explanation and really started to think about uh, what it meant on the y-axis uh, for, you know, this idea and concept of access. Uh, and then on the x-axis uh, for these concepts of uh, belonging, both being conditional uh, and unconditional. Uh, and in thinking about uh, the segregated area, uh, I, I tell this story a lot. I grew up with a mother uh, who de desegregated schools uh, in Kentucky uh, in the late, in the mid 1960s. And uh, she would oftentimes tell us, me and my sister stories uh, about her experience uh, in, in the segregated school and would oftentimes signal how uh, her experience in that school was a qualitatively better experience uh, than in the desegregated school uh, that she attended. And, and for a long time, I used to wonder and not fully understand what she was getting at when, when she was making that comparison. Because you know I think we've all uh, can agree that segregation is, is not something that we wanna strive for. But what she was really talking about was she knew that she belonged there. She had an unconditional sense of belonging in that particular space. Um, moving on to the left, you see the excluded quadrant, which is, um, can be referred to as oftentimes either a fraternity or sorority or a country club. Uh, and then above that, uh, you can see that we have the integrated quadrant, which oftentimes uh, can be perceived as the place towards which, you know, we in society would like to strive. But uh, what we have to remember about uh, integration is that integration uh, can sometimes provide access uh, at uh, the cost of one's true sense of, of belonging. And so uh, people will wind up wanting to see, seek and find their sense of belonging still within that integrated quadrant. And, you know, to, and this kind of gets us to, you know, what Beverly Tatum had oftentimes wrote about, which was why are all of the black kids sitting together uh, in the cafeteria? Um, and so ultimately what we want to be able to do in terms of thinking about the climate and culture we want to create is one where access is high, uh, and um, belonging is unconditional and really begin to try to think deeply uh, and focus on how uh, we are creating a, a climate and culture uh, where everyone feels uh, that they belong. And so we've incorporated that as our second key um, um, to really uh, begin to build around uh, these ideas uh, that were brought to us by uh, uh, Professor John Powell uh, from uh, the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and Professor Powell talks about the fact that being, or belonging rather, is uh, about being fully human. Um, and it really means more than having access. And a lot of times when we engage in these conversations, whether, um, and we're trying to solve uh, for problems, we oftentimes want to solve it just by access. Um, but it's not simply access to his point. Belonging entails being respected at a basic level. It includes the right to both co-create and make demands um, upon society. And uh, making those demands matter uh, in a fundamental way. Um, uh, knowing that we need to belong is, is a key part of our, uh, of our hierarchy of needs. Uh, we've uh, modified these hierarchy of needs just uh, 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 briefly. Uh, in terms of thinking about our physiological need, our safety need, and our belonging need. And, and we uh, tweaked uh, esteem for achievement just a little bit and then moves us into self-actualization. Uh, for all of us, you know, over these past 12 months living through this pandemic, I think we've all kind of made sense of, uh, you know, our own hierarchy of needs as we've just gone through this uh, process of, of trying to survive. Um, 
And in dealing with that, there's been a significant amount of conflict uh, that we've seen just within the past uh, 12 months. And in a lot of that conflict, uh, believe it or not, has related directly uh, to this idea and concept of belonging. And, you know, we saw this with Christian Cooper. Uh, and, you know, there was a story in the news yesterday about uh, the result of that particular case. And we all perhaps remember this so well, where Christian Cooper was um, uh, bird watching and a woman had her dog off her leash. And uh, basically, uh, he asked her to put the dog back on the leash and she called the police. And what was so unique about that scenario was you have in him uh, someone who felt the authority to feel as if he belonged there. Um, um, we have Amara Walker, uh, who has talked a lot about uh, the anti-Asian hate uh, that she's experienced, one where she experienced three quick incidents in an airport within succession of one another. Um, I mean, you can see even in her tweet, she says, I hate to say this, but I belong. Uh, additionally, uh, one of the more tragic examples uh, had to do with uh, Ahmad Arbery uh, this summer uh, in terms of him jogging through a neighborhood uh, and doing something that I know that I've done on, on a number of times, um, but nonetheless was, was hunted down and, and killed um, by people who lived in that neighborhood because they did not um, believe that he belonged here or belonged there rather. And so in our book, we talk about belonging uh, as the extent to which people feel personally appreciated, validated, accepted, and treated fairly. Um, and because people aren't going to be worried about being treated as a, as a stereotype. Uh, and we know that being treated like a stereotype uh, has an impact on our ability to be able to uh, succeed and, and really be able to achieve uh, in schools. And so, you know, John and I have talked about the fact that uh, we feel that, you know, in our educational system, we almost have an indignant hierarchy of needs, right, where uh, we wind up having to achieve in order to belong. Uh, as opposed to following the true nature of the hierarchy, which is making sure that you belong in order to achieve. Um, and uh, when you do achieve, you don't necessarily really belong, um, but in some respects, you just simply fit in. Uh, and so what we really want to begin to start thinking about is a lot of times over the past number of years in schools, we've spent uh, an unbelievable amount of focus uh, on this issue of achievement and achievement gaps. And I know Rich talks about this uh, in his talk as well, uh, which is the fact that while we have focused on achievement gaps, one area where we perhaps should be dedicating our focus to is beginning to think about uh, the gaps in belonging so that we can then begin to attend to our gaps uh, in achievement. And we say this because we know that a lack of belonging uh, leads to a lot of the effects that we tend to focus on in school. We like to focus on bullying and suicide and dropout and attendance. And a all of that is a function of the fact uh, that we tend not to believe or we tend not to pay attention uh, to who belongs and who doesn't belong. And so in getting to the problem specific uh, component uh, that I'd mentioned early on, it is critically important uh, that we go about assessing the climate uh, within our organizations uh, for belonging and uh, really thinking about um, you know, this from a broad perspective. Ed Week actually conducted a survey uh, on this particular issue in 2017, so about four years ago, uh, wanting to kind of think about where were the, the, the teacher's greatest concern in terms of this issue of belonging. Uh, and you can see that the numbers are, are, are pretty uh, flat uh, in terms of language proficiency, in terms of strongly agree versus disagree. You'll see that there's a higher number in terms of gender. Uh, I can assume that that has a lot to do uh, with subject areas. Um, uh, as well, kind of moving forward, uh, there was a question of how much do you think uh, that belonging, fact contri belonging contributes to student success? Uh, one of the areas that you can clearly see here is that, that most people uh, have agreed very much that this was uh, the particular case. So one concrete example where we've actually started to see this concept and this idea begin to get put in place uh, has been at Harvard University. Uh, in 2016, um, the university, um, the, the, the charge from the president was to create a task force uh, on inclusion and belonging uh, and really beginning to focus on kind of we're, we're focusing on the promise of ensuring that all of not only their faculty and staff, but, but most importantly, their students 
uh, felt as if uh, they belonged there. And the result of that was the creation uh, of Harvard University's uh, Inclusion and Belonging Pulse uh, Survey. Um, and they began to administer this survey uh, university-wide, um, asking these nine questions. And on their face, uh, these nine questions don't really seem like they would amount to very much. But where I uh, speak to the fact of the power and the uniqueness in what they're doing, has to do with how they're actually disaggregating the information. And their disaggregation of the information related to um, specific identity categories. And so you can see they're actually checking to see which groups have greater senses of belonging uh, within uh, the university context. And whether that be gender identity, race, race or ethnicity, uh, sexual identity, parent education level, which you would think at, at, a, at an institution uh, like Harvard that has a lot of legacy admissions, that matters. Uh, citizenship, political ideology, uh, obviously because universities uh, are frequently uh, criticized uh, for um, uh, being uh, overly liberal, uh, religious preference uh, and frequency of attendance. And so this is like a real concrete example of how one organization went about identifying the specific problem so that they could then understand what actions. And if you look at Harvard's executive summary, uh, the, the student groups who, um, who felt as if they belonged the least were those uh, who were in the LGBTQ community. Uh, and so then what that allowed for the university to do was to begin to create an action plan um, that really began to focus on this. Because what we do know uh, is that there were really kind of uh, two concepts um, that are at play here. Uh, one is a concept um, basically of othering. Uh, and another uh, is a concept of belonging. And when we do these professional developments uh, in person, we, we work through each of these uh, ideas to really be able to uh, get people to talk about uh, an experience or a time uh, where they have felt othered uh, and um, an experience or a time where they have felt uh, that they belonged. Uh, and we talk about it in this way uh, because not everybody has had uh, an experience uh, with racism, and not everybody has had an experience with sexism, uh, and not everybody has had an experience uh, with homophobia. Uh, but we've all had an experience uh, where we've been made to feel uh, as if uh, we do not uh, belong. And so it is critically important uh, for us to be able to uh, create uh, an environment uh, where uh, we feel uh, like we belong and we have to go about uh, trying uh, to measure that. Oh, trying to open my breakout room. Sorry if I'm stuttering here a little bit. Um, and so uh, as we get into our third key, uh, before we get into our uh, breakout rooms here real quick, uh, is this importance of, of taking action. Uh, and action a lot of times has been taken uh, through legislation. Um, whether it be any of the, you know, uh, uh, cases or any of the particular laws that you see on the left uh, or through uh, desegregation cases, um, or um, really specifically thinking about a number of the scholars who have attempted to influence uh, our thinking, uh, whether it's James Banks and multicultural education, uh, Geneva Gay and culture relevant pedagogy, or, or, or Geneva, Gay, Geneva Gay and culture responsive teaching, or the Warrior Lasson Billings and, and, and culture relevant pedagogy, the idea is an attempt to be able to, to shift our minds um, in, a, in a much different way to think about um, this problem. And John and I have tried to boil this down to its essence, really beginning to think about what these scholars are trying to get us to, which is these two ideas of belonging and dignity. Now, dignity uh, is an idea where we talk about, you know, our inherent value and worth. Uh, and uh, it is really sort of the internal state of peace. Uh, that comes with the recognition um, uh, and the value and in the, in the, in the vulnerability of all living things. And uh, while we are all born with dignity, uh, we're not necessarily all born with the ability to treat one another with dignity. And, and Dr. Hicks talks about the fact that dignity is a fundamentally different idea than respect. And I think this is a really important thing to remember. Respect is something uh, that we earn. Um, respect is not something that is inherent. So if we earn respect, it is because I respect you for the things that you've done. I can respect you for because you're a good parent. I can respect you because uh, of the things that you've accomplished in life. But dignity is something uh, that, is, that is fundamental to us all. Uh, and so because of that, 
um, well, she reminds us that good people uh, with good intentions can harm others if we're not conscious uh, of dignity. Because like I said, we're all born with it. We're not necessarily all born with the ability to treat one another with it. And, and, and Dr. Hicks notes that uh, when we think about dignity, we can do two, one of two things, honor or violate it, which sounds simple, but she, she makes a very clear and specific point that all human conflict uh, is the result of some form uh, or some part uh, of a dignity violation. And we have to find our way to be able to honor dignity, to be able to get ourselves through conflict. And she notes that it can be as something as simple as a fight between loved ones or something as incredibly complicated uh, as a quarrel between nations. And so it should be no surprise then that when we go back and look uh, at our heroes in the civil rights area, era, why they relied so heavily upon dignity as a strategy to be able um, to appeal to the masses. Uh, John Lewis, the late great John Lewis talks about the fact that whenever he was arrested, he tried to walk with a sense uh, of pride and dignity uh, wherever he went. Um, you will also see this idea and concept emerge uh, as it relates to um, uh, many of the injustices that we saw uh, in 2020, uh, whether it be related to Vanessa Guillen, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, or Elijah McLean, uh, you will constantly see this idea uh, in this term uh, come up. And uh, Alicia Brown noted that while we can use different words and different terms that these scholars have brought us uh, to help us think differently about these problems and these challenges, Ultimately, what we are trying to do uh, with these ideas and concepts is make sure that we are creating systems and structures that would allow for us to teach our, our children in our schools and create systems for our children in our schools um, um, with the same level of dignity and respect um, that we would create, teach, that we, that we would have for our own. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm gonna give you all um, probably about 10 to 12 minutes or so uh, to um, engage in a, breakout room, uh, what I'd like for you to do so you can get me out of the room talking is uh, do a quick say something a protocol. Uh, you will be in uh, relatively small groups um, uh, of about four or five participants uh, and uh, want you to continue to focus on listening, um, um, but wanting to make sure more than anything else that we give everybody uh, in the room an opportunity to speak. Uh, my goal is to let this run for no longer than 10 minutes. Uh, and then we'll return back to the room uh, from there and, and finish up the rest of the presentation. Right. Well, welcome back, uh, everyone. Um, as we uh, start to uh, get closer to our, our conclusion, um, wanted to uh, just touch base with you briefly on uh, how we've tried to help conceptualize this in a, in a model um, <clears throat> um, uh, through this particular framework. Uh, one having to do with uh, this idea of looking at it from the, the outside uh, in terms of the four uh, outer part, really focusing on dispositions for dignity, uh, thinking about four personal capacities uh, that need to be nurtured in order to make sure um, uh, the dignity is honored. And so obviously openness, listening, patience, uh, and empathy. Uh, on the inner ring uh, is our indicators of belonging, uh, which really begin to focus on uh, how people will let you know how they feel. Uh, in, in terms of whether or not they feel as if they belong and when dignity is honored, people feel appreciated, accepted, uh, validated, uh, and treated fairly. Uh, which brings us to the next uh, area on the inside, which we've identified as just standards for dignity, which uh, allow for us to um, appreciate unique differences, uh, presume competence and positive intent, build partnership and community and repair harm uh, and restore relationships. and. Uh, when taken together, uh, this is what we have theorized as ways for, for people to be able to, to move forward. Uh, on the opposite, uh, we have uh, created uh, dignity distorters uh, on the outer quadrant, which focuses on judgment, denial, apathy, and intolerance. Um, uh, indicators of in indignity uh, and humiliation, thinking about people feeling mistreated, otherwise dismissed and marginalized. Uh, and then finally on the inside, uh, really focusing on uh, dignity violations themselves, uh, focusing on degrading differences, uh, presuming incompetence, blaming and shaming uh, and dominating. And ultimately when we think about what we're looking to measure, 
um, we're trying to get more of what is on the left uh, and a lot of um, less uh, of what is on the right. Uh, and when taken together, uh, it'll get us uh, to a place where we can start to create greater belonging through a culture of dignity. And so uh, as I get ready to close, one thing that I, I, I want to uh, for you all to, to keep in mind uh, are really just some practical tips um, um, for keeping dignity uh, at the center. Uh, in terms of our school and our classroom roles, um, we have to ask ourselves whether or not uh, they communicate, be it intentionally or unintentionally, uh, who belongs and who doesn't belong, uh, who's worthy of dignity uh, and who's not worthy of dignity. Uh, I, I think about this a lot uh, as somebody who spent a great deal of my career as a disciplinarian, uh, working and supporting with students uh, who were outside of the classroom. And um, um, one of the things that I know that I used to say casually uh, that I've now reflected on quite a bit after having written this book um, is my use of the term speaking with the kid, does this kid belong here? Um, or does this kid belong in this class? Or does this kid belong, belong, bop, 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 bop. Those would be things that I would oftentimes say, not realizing that for an adolescent, um, the need to belong is, is a critically important piece and incredibly important feature of, of, uh, of any human being's life, but, but most importantly for someone who's still in the process of discovering um, themselves. Additionally, um, when I know, notice that a student is unprepared for class, uh, am I conscious of, of avoiding humiliation? Uh, humiliation is one of the most powerful emotions that we as human beings can experience. Um, and it's something that we have to keep in mind. And then finally, do my curriculum choices imply who's deserving of dignity and who doesn't belong? Um, this has been an ongoing debate and conversation that we've had uh, in, in public education around uh, our selections uh, of materials and um, whether or not the dignity and the humanity of those characters are fully present uh, at all time. Are, are we simply uh, selecting materials that are, uh, are only reflective of uh, violating uh, the dignity uh, of specific groups of people? And so I want for you to keep those ideas and thoughts uh, and topics in mind uh, as we begin to move forward. And uh, I hope that throughout this time, I've given you a little bit of something uh, you know, to think about uh, and uh, to consider in, in terms of your perspective. And so I wanted to make sure that I got through um, uh, this particular presentation a little bit sooner. So I cut out one of the, uh, the breakout sessions because what I did wanna do was uh, allow for a little bit of time as we begin to get towards the end to open up uh, the room for any questions. Uh, what I would ask is that if we could instead of just turning our mic off since we've got a, a good chunk of people who are in the room. Uh, if you happen to have any questions, um, we could put them in the chat and then uh, hopefully uh, our facilitator can help us um, uh, call those down and, and, and she can uh, let me know uh, what a couple of them are that might emerge. So uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes to see if you happen to have any questions that might emerge uh, for you at this time. One question that, that popped up is in regards to tools for measuring that sense of that sense of belonging with students and families. And you mentioned the Harvard survey. Do you have other examples of, of tools that are just good for gathering that data? Yeah, the U.S. Department of Education has an entire website that is dedicated just to this. Um, uh, I can send you a copy of the link. Uh, somebody had just asked me about it yesterday uh, about it, um, but it has an entire long list of, of surveys um, in general. The psychological sense of membership scale is probably one of the first scales that was created um, uh, to measure belonging. Uh, I think the most important piece uh, that needs to be, that we need to pay attention to um, is while the items are important, the disaggregation is probably even more important because one of the things that we can do that is gonna be most harmful is if we simply take a climate measure and measure that information at the aggregate but don't get into the nuance of how specific groups of students are feeling, we won't be able to actually create an actionable, actionable solution that leads us to those circumstances where, where catalysts emerge. Uh, and so it's, it's really, really, really important to make sure that, you know, John and I don't, I, the, the, the need to be able to identify the categories wind up being kind of community and culture dependent and specific. 
Uh, and the reason for that is, is that, you know, one example, as I had mentioned, there was one high school that we had where a principal saw that his specific problem was with, you know, um, um, black girls in ninth grade who didn't belong to a club. Like he was able to get it to that low of a level. Uh, another high school was able to find that there were similarities in terms of a lack of belonging for, for, for children who came from families uh, whose parents worked in a specific factory. And so that level of disaggregation and that level of drilling down becomes a real critical factor. How do you sort of address if on the surveys, a lot of that demographic information is optional and some people might not feel comfortable actually identifying? I think, I think that it, it's got to be part of a broader communication strategy in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you're right, the data is only as good as, as people identifying um, themselves. However, um, if, um, um, if we oftentimes know that there's a sense of a problem without actually getting into the, to the specific nature of it. Um, and it's, it, that becomes sort of a leadership task of wanting to make sure that, that the community is coming along with you to understand what this information is being used for mm -hmm. and is something that will be a continual effort. I think a lot of times what can happen is, is that it can be a one shot deal and it's like, oh, we had this thing or it's the initiative as opposed to the actual way that we go about fully measuring what's happening. Like in my, my role as an adjunct faculty member, I'm literally hired back based upon how well my students feel that they had an experience with me. It's, 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 it's not on test scores, right? It's not on grades. It's literally about whether or not my instruction was worthy of the money that they spent for their course. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we haven't framed our solutions like that in terms of our relationships, in terms of working with students and teachers, because as I mentioned in the book, you know, um, belonging in public schools is really sort of countercultural. It is something that we're still continuing to work towards uh, over time. And so it, it will take some education for some people to be able to understand why that's important. And, um, you know, in, in, in it, but, it, but it is important to be able to use that as a data set so you can get a clear understanding of which group feels high and low, because you may find uh, circumstances in, in schools where um, you know, elementary schools may have such a circumstance where boys may feel, you know, far more excluded than, than any of the girl populations. Yeah, one of the other questions in here is any advice on the impacts of school choice within districts and how they might impact belonging. So when certain families go to a magnet program or a, a magnet school, how does that impact the sense of belonging? Well, magnet schools and <laughs> magnet schools and you know, school choice actually is an effect. Um, th 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 that is a solution that we have created at a policy level to be able to address people's lack of a sense of belonging in their neighborhood school. And so what can happen is people go out and they seek whatever feeling and or space that they feel that they most uh, appropriately um, belong. Um, and, and so those, that search is going to continue if we don't ever get to a point where we're actually addressing, you know, the fundamental need. I, I, I say this often that, you know, if you've ever had an opportunity to work in a high school where the football team is winning uh, and they're competing for a state championship or the basketball team is winning and you're competing for a state championship, um, the climate and the culture of the school is a fundamentally different place. Uh, attendance goes up. Uh, behavior goes down, grades goes up, kids are happy to be there, teachers are happy to be there, attendance is because people are want to be associated um, with a winner and they, they've found what that emotional connection of what it feels like, you know, to belong to high school X or to be associated with this uh, particular mascot. Those elements and those things matter in terms of our ability to, to um, to create that specific climate that we're that we're really working towards, and so I always, oftentimes explain it, you know, in terms of that visualization because many people have a clear, you know, memory of what that felt like, whether it was through their own experience as a student or, or certainly um, in their experience as a teacher and educator. Um, there's a question here regarding. Um, I'm just going to read it to you. Advocating for students is essential. 
teaching kids to advocate for themselves by saying what they need is vital, but self-advocacy can be seen as aggression, especially with black girls. Do you have good resources to address this, this idea or this problem? I, I mean, I think, I, I think it's, that's a significant, I, I, the short answer is I don't have necessarily resources. That is a significant burden to place on students um, um, to be able to, uh, to basically lay claim that they belong here because that's basically what they're doing is, is the, the need for self-advocacy, the need uh, to be able to assert oneself, um, all is born out of a fact that that hasn't been addressed in some other way. And so then they've had to take on this burden or take on uh, this responsibility um, um, by themselves. And when that happens, the sort of dynamics, the historical stereotypes that are associated with specific groups come into play. My response to that is that the, the ultimate goal with that is that the responsibility should not be borne upon the students. That if, if we are educators and working in a system, uh, that should be what we are working towards to ensure that, that, that students of a specific group don't need to do that. However, while all of that is ongoing and, and um, changing, I think that there's also a reality that you know, our students have to understand that, that while we are still moving towards creating a society that, um, um, uh, that honors the dignity of everybody and, and truly signals that, that everyone is belonging and worthy of being here, um, there are going to have to be um, lessons that, that get learned over time in terms of how to uh, manage these particular dynamics and situations. Because unfortunately, um, uh, my experience personally with those situations didn't simply stop at high school. Uh, they continued you know, throughout my professional life. And I think that all of us, um, in, in terms of our identities, are going to have to um, contend with uh, the realities of what it means uh, to be and what it means to be in certain spaces um, uh, and how to negotiate that. And so there, unfortunately there is no rule book uh, to be able to follow uh, when it comes to that. But ultimately, if you, know, you are working in an organization that has a commitment towards this end, the commitment should be to remove that burden um, in, in the end from the students and, and place that burden you know, back on the organization itself. Yeah, and um, maybe the very last question we have here is, um, what is the next step after you have that disaggregated data that shows that there are some specific student groups who do not feel they belong? How do you get at a real solution that doesn't just feel like window dressing um, or some easy fix, uh, how do you really dig deeper? Yeah. I mean, it, first things first is, is developing a, a, a prototype and a strategy to be able to address the concern. And I think it's important to be able to work with the students or the groups of people to be able to address the concern. Um, certainly the survey data is important, but talking to people uh, I think is, is, is vitally important to be able to say, these are the data that we gathered. This is the information that we found. We found that students in your group aren't, um, do not feel as welcome or as other as other students. Can you then tell me what might we need to do to be able to do that to, to improve this? And I can tell you, I can assure you that they will be able to tell you very specifically in terms of what their own unique and specific circumstances are, what need to be need to be done. The challenge with that is is once you talk with them, you have to yeah. do it. Yep. Because one of the worst things that you can do is say, that, hey, I'm interested in helping you and interested in supporting you, and then you don't follow through. Yeah. Far and away, that is the worst possible thing uh, that you can do. And I think it's really important to make sure, um, uh, really important to make sure um, that um, you follow through. And, 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 and there may not, it, you may not hit a home run the first time, but we have to continue to move to measure to be able to see over time whether or not it's happening. And if you're engaging in this type of measurement, you would measure this in the same way that you would measure third grade test scores. 
yeah. uh, because- Get away from the, I think I feel to something more solid. Yeah. Precisely. 